Hello and welcome to another episode of Ancient Warfare Answers. I think this is episode 145. It goes so quickly. We have we're up to a gross now, Murray. Um, I am I am Jasport. Well, actually, a gross plus one, of course. I am Jasport. i the editor of Ancient Warfare, and uh, with me is Murray Dam, the assistant editor. And um, uh, and and we do all these these well, answering these questions. Um, for our patrons and for everybody else, but um, we really like it if you would like to become a patron and possibly get the magazine. Um, but you can certainly pose questions if you're not a patron. We like them all. We are uh, always interested to see what what we what you come up can come up with and what we can manage to answer or waffle about, like I'm doing right now. Apologies. Um, one of the questions that we have is were. Philip and Alexander of Macedon uniquely qualified in what they did. Murray, can you answer that for me? Well, uh, short answer is yes and no. Um, they were both remarkable commanders uh, and they used their forces in efficient and uh, incredibly successful ways. But at the same time, no, because the circumstances under which they operated were different from the successes and what had come before. So in a previous ancient warfare answers, we've looked at the evolution of the phalanx to what becomes the Macedonian phalanx in the, the mid fourth century BC and the sort of the, the trend that had been going along in classical hoplite phalanxes of extending the, the length of the spear. Uh, none of those longer spears are anywhere near the length of the Macedonian Sarissa. Uh, and so whether it's Philip or the the rulers of Macedon before Philip who reformed the infantry of uh, Macedonia to become the, what we know as the Macedonian phalanx, we're not sure. But certainly by the reign of Philip, the Macedonian phalanx is a defined unit of about 9,000 men, six, six taxes of 1,500 men each, each one of those taxes is from a particular region in Macedonia. Uh, and they're... they're Officer class come from the same region, so they're they're very much uh, ethnographical uh, in terms of their organisation. That system stays for all of Alexander's conquests. So in many ways, that system becomes a uniquely bonded and uniquely competent force in itself to the point that both Philip and Alexander can rely on the phalanx to do what the phalanx needs to do. It has six commanders and then an overall commander. Uh, they are left to their own devices very much in several of Alexander's battles and off he goes charging around with the cavalry. Uh, Philip similarly. So in that regard, uh, they are uniquely competent in the sense that they have this amazing formation that they can take advantage of. So that's a, that's a part of the yes, but part of the no is that this formation of the phalanx is already uh, becoming an entity unto itself, and that being being one of the foot companions, as they're called, is very much a, a, an elite role within Macedonian warfare. They know what they have to do on the battlefield. They know that they are both a, a, a mighty attacking force, but also a bulwark of defense, so that if there's a heroic, foolhardy cavalry charge that needs to happen, as both Alexander and Philip lead, they hold the line in the centre uh, and allow those cavalry charges to occur. So in the way, yes, it's remarkable that both Philip and Alexander are able to wield that weapon. And of course, both Philip and Alexander then and Alexander combine that with light armed troops and cavalry uh, of different ethnicities to remarkable effect, Alexander more than Philip, because of course, one of the other things that we need to take into account for any general is their luck. Now, Philip is lucky on the battlefield and very unlucky off the battlefield and perhaps in love. Um, so in many ways, Philip's career is an unlucky one. At the same time, he's lucky, you know, uh, he survives some brutal wounds taken on the battlefield, which most people wouldn't survive uh, for centuries until the, the uh, you know, the, the invention of modern antibiotics. But uh, when it comes to the fact that he's assassinated early and isn't able to fulfill his plans, absolutely, he's unlucky. He's lucky also in the sense that Alexander is the man who uh, succeeds him. And Alexander 
follow through with the plans that he must have had some part of with his father. You know, it's not like you suddenly have a new king who says, nah, not going to do what dad wanted. I'm going to do my own path. So there's very much a succession plan of, of, of invasion and defeating the Persians as well between the two of them. So Alexander, of course, is incredibly lucky on the battlefield, uh, never loses a battle. He, you know, invades Persia, fights for 10 years uh, and has a remarkable stream of, of successes. So in that regard, yes, he is uniquely uh, competent. But at virtually all of those battles, Alexander is putting himself in peril and there is only one Alexander. And if any one of those battles, Alexander had fallen, probably what happened uh, under the successes in the Diadochoi would have happened then. There would have been an immediate rupturing of whatever alliance Alexander had amongst his commanders, and they would have divided whatever empire Alexander had at that point amongst themselves. And then we would have had the Hellenistic period of a much smaller period of a much smaller area warring with itself. So the interesting thing is that Alexander is able to hold all of these commanders together. And these are younger men, younger than him and men older than him. Um, and it's, it's a remarkable uh, job that he does because Again, he's got the the left wing is is competent and commanded by one of his uh, subordinate commanders, and then he's got the phalanx who can do what they need to do in terms of holding the centre. They're mo normally moving forward in echelon, but that seems to be something that they've learned and trained under Philip and possibly earlier. Uh, Alexander, then, of course, if you look at Galgamela, uh, Issus, and uh, the Granicus. He does the same thing in all three battles. Uh, he has the phalanx in the center. He's got his left wing to deal with the Persian right wing. He then leads his cavalry off towards the right, which creates uh, the Persians moving to counter his move. By doing so, they make some kind of weakness in their line. And then when he sees that weakness in their line appear, he charges straight for the enemy commander. He does that uh, in the three major battles of his um, career, defeating the the, the Persians. So in a way, he does the same trick three times. Uh, and so you would think that rather than just massing a huge army, so at Galgamela, you know, Alexander has 40,000 men and Darius brings, according to some sources, a million men against him. Uh, so rather than just choosing more men, um, you possibly could have done, well, when he moves out to the right, don't follow him. You know, we can quite easily just hold here and his tactic won't work, but that's not what they do. So in a way, he's also lucky in the sense that the, the, the enemies he's fighting against, uh, certainly in the, in the case of the, the Persians, do what he needs them to do to, to defeat them. Um, and so in a way, that's, that's not so much him being uniquely competent, it's them <laughs> being uniquely incompetent. And in that, he's very lucky because he's fighting a foe that isn't as cohesive as him, that doesn't have the same, you know, doesn't have the same uh, control over his subordinate commanders and, and all sorts of things. As the, as the campaigns progress, he does indeed have to do more very difficult fighting, whether it be the Sogdian Rock or whether it be, uh, you know, the, 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 the harsh campaigning up into the, uh, the Kush and, the, and Afghanistan and then, of course, across into the Indian campaigns. All of these become more difficult and more nuanced campaigns, and Alexander is uniquely lucky in fighting all of those without mishap, even though he's wounded several times uh, in his battles. And each time, that's a massive crisis for the Macedonians that Alexander is wounded, and each time he recovers. So, in a way, the competence of Alexander and Philip are... Not, not so much out of their control as to do with things like luck and and battlefield competences, which aren't necessarily their personal ones, but the the system in which they have inherited or, or, or honed. Uh, what happens after Alexander with the, the... I mean, there are great commanders in the Hellenistic period, uh, whether it be Pyrrhus, whether it be Demetrius. Some of them are unlucky in the sense of what they end up having to fight and how they end up having... how they end up falling. But there's also a problem of stagnation, and that is that you have Macedonian phalanxes fighting Macedonian phalanxes. And so they aren't trying to overcome different foes. They aren't trying to conquer new lands. They're trying to hold lands that they have and fight each other. So what you find is this kind of a, an arms race within the Hellenistic period of 
let's build a bigger phalanx. My phalanx is bigger than your phalanx. I've got more elephants. I've got more cavalry. And so you actually get this, this kind of brinksmanship of Macedonian warfare, so much so that when the Romans start to come in uh, into Greece and then through Asia Minor, they're fighting a, a phalanx that has passed its best. Uh, of course, when Pyrrhus invades Italy in the 280s, you've got the opposite. You've got that actually they're almost on a par with the Roman legion. And so as that Hellenistic period continues, the stagnation gets worse and worse. Thank you. Very comprehensive.